So good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the ODI. Welcome to the latest in the series of ODI Friday's lectures. Um, just a couple of bits from me before we get started. Um, please do hold off on your questions until the end, um, and then we'll make sure we pass the microphone around for you to ask them. And um, we will be live streaming um, the, the lecture this afternoon. So if you are watching um, by the stream, please do get your questions in on Twitter using the ODI Fridays hashtag, and we'll make sure to get those asked at the end. Um, I'm really happy to be introducing the team from the Science Museum today who are going to tell us more about how they're going about opening up their collections to the world. Um, I think that's all from me. So with that, welcome. Uh, hello. Good afternoon. Thank you for inviting us. Uh, so my name is John Stack. I'm the Digital Director of the Science Museum. Uh, and I'm joined by my colleagues uh, Jamie Unwin and Dave Passion, and we're going to talk you through <coughs> some work that we've done uh, over the, the uh, last year or so. Uh, so the first thing to uh, I thought I'd talk about is a kind of a history of museum catalogue data because you might think that a uh, museum is full of lots of different kinds of things and our uh, collection is extraordinarily diverse, everything from bicycles to bits of paper to nuts and bolts to aeroplanes and steam locomotives. Um, fundamentally, museum data is, uh, in its long history, it has never really been catalogued uh, for public consumption. The underlying uh, records are there to manage the collection. So to manage um, uh, where an object is, uh, various legal statuses about it, where it's earmarked to go on uh, loan, uh, where it is now, if it's in storage, what part of the museum it's in, uh, if there are hazards associated with it. So we have a lot of objects with asbestos. We use it to uh, monitor and audit those things. Uh, and if there are conservation issues, we use um, the, the catalog to manage those things. And th this is all done within a very uh, specialized piece of software, which we call a collection management system. Uh, um, so for uh, 100 years or, or more, working from pieces of paper and, uh, and literally library index cards, uh, through to now within the uh, databases, fundamentally the, the catalog is about managing the collection. Uh, and then 20 years ago, or however we measure it, along comes uh, the World Wide Web. And suddenly we start to be able to sort of rethink access. So about 20 years ago, you start to see uh, museums uh, start to digitize their collections to take uh, subsets of that uh, ca catalog information and to put it online and to photograph the uh, objects uh, and put those things online in a big uh, searchable database. So to turn the access of the catalog from uh, or to the collection from being a thing that you have to come to the museum to see, or if you're a, uh, an academic and a researcher and you have a specialist interest in the things in store, you could phone us up and probably write a letter to saying why you why you should be allowed to give access to the material and you'd be allowed into reading rooms and stores and, and things like that. So suddenly, all the stuff everywhere. Uh, so we dug out this from uh, 1995 about what our digital ambitions were then. Uh, early next year, the Science Museum will have its own address on the internet and just a few pages will be added at first, but more pages will be put up until about 20 pages with hypertext links will be able to be accessed. <laughs> so we had lofty ambitions even from the beginning. And it's very easy to, of course, in the future, in 20 years' time, someone will be watching this video and making a fool of me. Uh, so we have had our collection online since pretty early. This is its first uh, uh, iteration. Uh, and it was uh, sh uh, uh, shortly thereafter, a public API was built onto this um, early interface. And we, so we've had a sort of uh, an open data initiative uh, really for quite a long time. In the last year, we have decided that while this thing is OK, we could do a lot better. So we've, we've initiated a very large project to look again at how we deliver our collections online uh, and how we open up the data associated with it. Uh, so this is our new collections website. And so I mean, fundamentally, we need something with big pictures, which is really fast, uh, and where the search uh, works. Um, and then we've really started to think about, OK, what does access mean in the 21st century? What are the kind of uh, ways in which we could open up the collection more than just saying, well, there's stuff, there's pictures, and there's text on the website? So a few things we've chosen to do. Put, a, put all the images that we can under a Creative Commons license and make that as easy as possible to uh, access, but also to try and present the information about uh, what, does that, what does that actually mean? Because I think for all the people in this room and probably the people watching online, we sort of know what a Creative Commons license is and we know what the dimensions of it are, non-commercial, share alike, and 
and the others. Uh, but we felt like it was important to really start to explain that to, to teachers and to others so that we actually really did encourage the use of those licenses. We're using the, mostly, we're using the uh, attribution non-commercial share alike license. So it's actually, of all the Creative Commons licenses, it's actually the most restrictive. But we had to like, take this through the organization and convince everybody to start uh, on this journey. And obviously, we would love to go more open than that, and we'll do it as we go forward. Um, the second thing we did was the entire collection uh, uh, website is open sourced, uh, which means if you want to, you can like download the source code, uh, run it on your laptop, point it at our API, and you can like basically run the uh, Build Your Own Science Museum group collection. And, we, and in this instance, we chose the MIT license. And the reason for that was it was just the simplest one. It's like it's actually only about this long. And it basically says uh, uh, you can kind of do what you want with our stuff. Uh, the third thing was we uh, opened up all the underlying uh, data for the catalog using the uh, public, uh, Creative Commons Zero public domain uh, dedication license. And the reason for this is there probably are things in there, or, uh, although you could sort of make an argument that it probably uh, is probably almost in the public domain anyway. We felt like by giving it the CC0 dedication, we would just, we, if there were like any moral uh, rights in there or were there any database rights, we would just say, hey, take our stuff and go to town with it. So, and we've again made this really prominent. It's on every page uh, and you can uh, access the um, data easily. Uh, the third thing is to create an uh, application programming interface. So, uh, and museums have done this in different ways. Some museums have done, and uh, you know, like in just a like a, just a big dump of all the data as a CSV file, and that's actually quite easy to do. Uh, but since we were uh, in the process of building a collections website, which needed a new API anyway, we're in a good position to actually build an API that you could pass queries to, and it would uh, pass you back the data. Uh, so you, you probably know this uh, Tim Berners-Lee's sort of five-star rating for open data. So, which goes from make your stuff available under a license, uh, an open license in some format, proprietary or, other, or otherwise, through to linked data and all that good stuff. So we're about three. So we're sort of on a journey, but it feels like it's not a bad start. Uh, in terms of the kinds of things that, muse uh, that uh, the, the audiences have done with museum data, these are just four examples from uh, the Tate Gallery. So starting to look at using visualizations to start to explore the data in a way that is sort of impossible through uh, kind of without like scraping the whole site, uh, to looking at sort of new forms of scholarship and research, looking at the relationships between one thing and another. Uh, so where previously this would have taken an, an art historian uh, months, if not years, to start to look at these things, suddenly we can start to explore that data uh, and draw out um, new forms of knowledge from it. There are more kind of creative things that people have done with a museum uh, collection data. So this is, I don't know whether the term net art is now really kind of uh, archaic, probably is, so I'll put a question mark. Uh, but the, uh, this um, artist took the Tate uh, descriptive words and the categorizations of the way that the artworks were described and made something that would just generate an endless list of things using these kind of rather funny ways that museums talk about their uh, collections. And then th this uh, example is uh, an, an, a, a jewelry maker who has created an algorithm that uh, takes artworks from the open data and starts to create jewelry based on the uh, data sets, taking the colors and the shapes and so on. So I'll pass over to my colleague, Jamie, now. Hello. Um, I'm Jamie Allman. I'm the technical architect on Collections Online at the Science Museum. I'm probably going to cover some of the same topics as John, but maybe slightly slightly more technical and how we built it and extracted the data. Um, <coughs> I've started this slide because I've come from, came from a background for the museum of working with sort of events and news and jobs and travel and all those things have really structured data. And when I came to the museum, the first thing I realised was, and maybe John has said this, that you assume that they're like libraries, it's all going to be this beautifully data and it's all being catalogued and it's not. There's boxes where people have typed in a free text date or they might have just typed in, I think it is 1980. They, it's between these two dates. 
And so trying to pull all that out, you've got this problem and you can't start again because you've got hundreds of years of data that's come off cards. So you're dealing with this problem all the time of how, how do you extract that data? And secondly, how do you make it reliable? Because if we pull that data out and we get it wrong and then someone else goes and sucks it across. Um, so this is sort of dichotomy between how much you can munge it yourself and how much you've got to keep it, uh, how much it's got to go back to the curators and the collection services team who have got the controls over those systems. So we can't really go in there and just suddenly run massive scripts across all our dates and change all the dates because we think we've got a cool thing. It's got to be done very carefully. Um, and we've also got things like old places. So sort of in the museum, this historical place that might no longer exist and how those taxonomies work. Um, so that was the first thing of really how to do it. That you, you not work in this set, you're looking at kind of going how, um, how can we make sense of this? Um, this comes on sort of legacy systems that there isn't one thing we want. You can't just suddenly go, let's build a museum database site. You've actually, um, you've got existing systems. That content is already in there. So we actually mainly pull from three systems. So we have an archivist, which is, um, for those not in the museum, is actually documentation. It's about how documents are found, not, um, it's not what's in storage in terms of archives. Um, we have another collection system, which is about our objects, so more physical, tangible objects. Um, and then we also have a media library, which is where all our high-res images come from. And so these systems are completely disparate. So the first thing we had to do was actually look at how to join, join these three systems together, which we did. This is a very, very high level thing, but basically pull them out of the various internal systems. We then do lookups. And once again, there's, these systems aren't connected um, or haven't historically been connected. So we're doing two things. One is that we're looking at how fuzzy we can match the IDs across the, which images are tied to that. And at the same time, our, we've got our ICT department to try and join these up. So there's sort of parallel streams. There's sort of things you can do immediately. And there's things that, um, we can't do immediately, but we're putting into into process. We pull these through, join these up, put it back into Elasticsearch, which is kind of quite web native. We resize images and create zooms. We bring this through to the website, and we actually the API is um, is powering our own website. So we actually our own, the API that we expose at the base level is pretty much what we're using to power our own website. Which and that was quite a quite a conscious decision that we didn't didn't really want to be hanging off the side or the, the baseline we wanted the the two to be very tightly connected um we then built a prototype and that was really trying to us to get in a feel of the data but also communicating with everyone in the organization wh where the problems lied so the, the first stage really in a way was us building the website and getting on with it but it was also at the same time to be able to feed back into the wider organization things that might take longer to change um uh, Process-wise, um, and this is um, we really wanted to kind of get the, the archivists and the curators used to seeing the website and understanding how in the back end they can make those changes themselves. We didn't really want to take an export and suddenly work on that in the six months later. We wanted it as a live system, so getting that process in place where the curators felt that what they were seeing on the web when they were cataloging, they were cataloging for public consumption. Um, this is the website. Um, we've gone, so once again, it's very much an iterative approach. The code's on GitHub, we're continually updating it. Um, in terms of the API, the main thing we've done, so when we come through the website, we're actually, the first thing we're doing is creating this API. So we bring them all together from the, all those disparate systems in the back end doing some clean up on it and some rules base and then this is this is a version of what's in our elastic search index it's slightly less than what we use internally but it's the same structure and we we decided that we didn't really want to convert it completely into another format um, and then continually have to kind of keep that updated it was this is what we're using inside to power the website um, there's, a, there's a subset so there's more of this but we wanted to kind of keep it as much as as possible in line with what we use so that and it's based on content negotiation. So actually, um, done a bit of the URL hacking there. But actually, if you search for a page on the site and ask for it as JSON, you get back the JSON. If you ask, if you go in a normal web browser, you'll get it back as HTML. So the, the, there was that consideration as well, that a, a HTML page and a page of data, 
effectively the same thing. It's sort of, they're just different ways of displaying the data. So we didn't really want to build a, I mean, we may do it later on and we've had other people actually take this and convert it and build it in other things, but we wanted to keep the, we were showing pages of data, it's an API. So we're trying to keep the API very closely tied to the website. Um, in terms of um, where we're going on in the future, we'd love to get, so this is one of our pictures inside the, uh, uh, inside our collections since we pulled out. Um, we'd love to get more into kind of, as John said, get into that four points and the five points where we've actually got these URLs and IM points. The problem is in the original collections, we don't, there's lots of, why don't you publish all this open data? Why don't you have all these people as URLs? And the truth is that in the original systems, we don't have those people as URLs. And if we have Charles Babbage, although it's very easy for me to know that that Charles Babbage is that Charles Babbage on Wikipedia or in the Oxford DMB, it's very hard textually to match that up. So we're slowly going through and encouraging curators to put those URLs in as we get them. But it's not something we can go overnight and do. And what comes back to this question of being responsible for the data, that if we just make guesses about it and suddenly go, this is this person and we get it wrong, that could propagate out and then we'd have objects attributed to the wrong person. So that's something we're doing, but it's going to take time to, time to get there. That's a really quick run through. <laughs> I think, I mean, probably best is actually in a QA and a in more of the technical, if anyone wants to do it. But pass you over to Dave now, we can talk about how we actually use the data. So I get to do something <laughs> slightly different. Um, so I don't have to make it, I get to play with it or help people play with the data. So I'm Dave Patton, I'm head of new media at the Science Museum. Come in. Um, and I'm responsible for the digital things we do on the floor of the museum. Um, so... When we were looking at the API, we're kind of really keen for, um, to, to open that up and we don't think that necessarily we'll have the best ideas about how we might use the collection. So we really wanted to open this up to, um, to a wider community. And we were really fortunate. We've got a new initiative at the museum called Digital Lab, um, which is funded in the first instance by Samsung that allows us to do some of the more experimental work that we've always done quite a lot of in the museum and kind of do it in one place and talk about it as a, as a single entity. Um, and we decided one of the things we do under Digital Lab was to hold um, a hackathon around the API. So I worked with um, Mar Dixon, who does the um, Art and Curator, Museum Selfie Day, and has run Museum Mix, and Don Undine, who is the, or was the digital um, director of the Met Media Lab at Metropolitan Museum in New York. Um, and we constructed a two-day hackathon, and we put invitations out on Eventbrite. Uh, we basically sold or, or gave all of the tickets away within the first 48 hours um, to about 60 people. Um, and we had teams apply to come and be part of that. So we had teams from the Wellcome Trust, from other museums, the Natural History Museum, and from Tate. And we had lots of individuals come as well. So one of the things we needed to do when we got people there was to form people into teams. Uh, so this is uh, one of the, this is probably on the first day of the hack hackathon. We had a big space in the museum. We ran it over two days. Um, so we set people the challenge of exploring and doing interesting things with the API. And that could be anything. It could be online things. It could be physical things in the museum. Um, we had museum staff, so Jamie and John and myself and some other people from the museum were around to help. Um, we also brought in students from Goldsmiths College who helped um, push stuff out on social media for this and just help the teams building things. And this, sli this slide is titled Hackathon Number One because this is the first of at least two of these and probably a series of, the, of these that we'll do over the next few years. So people worked for a couple of days, and it was probably, probably in total just a, probably a day and a half of coding and building, and built a variety of different things. So we had 12 teams, um, and we got some different kind of categories of things. So some people built games, um, and this is probably one of the most polished of the games. This basically pulls things down from our collection and presents you with five objects, and you have to arrange them on a timeline. It seems really, really simple. There's something really quite compelling about this. And basically, every time you put an object on the timeline, if you're right, you just pause another object on, on the timeline. Um, so people, it, it's making people think about the ages of those things in the collection, engaging with the collection in a, in a more playful way. Um, 
couple of other teams develop games. Another category of, of um, projects we had were chatbots. So people building voice-based systems that they could interrogate uh, the collection um, using voice. So basically, you can ask the system, um, you know, tell me about trains the Science Museum has. Uh, and it will come back, and it's basically passing through the collections API and bringing back information, reading through the records, and then in letting you then further query that. So um, this has got this has had a match for train about signaling instruments. You can then dig in and ask it about signaling instruments, and it will come back. And we were quite interested in this, partly because of the um, the emergence of some of the voice-based assistants that we're seeing in homes now, and this is a different way that people might engage with our collections. Um, and it was quite interesting to see how quickly these systems were, were put together. Um, another category of, of uh, another, another group of teams worked on installations. So this is a, a large projected installation which just pulls down randomly things from the museum's collection and presents them on a timeline. So it's just pulling out objects and their, the date, the creation date of the objects. And it really gives a sense of the breadth of the collection and the size of the collection. And that's something we're quite keen to push into the museum. There's about 7% of the museum's collection is on display at any one time. So most of the collection is in store. And there are whole parts of the collection that are just not on public display. So something like this gives a real sense of all of those things that you don't necessarily see when you come to the museum. Um, and we're quite interested in this as something we might take forward to be able to pop up in spaces when we have an empty space between exhibitions, just to give people a real sense of how big the collection is and, and the breadth of collecting the museum does. Uh, and now I need to stop this. OK. Um, and the, uh, this is a different kind of installation. This is probably, this is probably our favourite um, project of, of the two days. This is the egg. Uh, this, was, uh, uh, this was developed by an agency that came as a team. Um, and the egg is a physical device um, which you collect when you come into the museum. And there are sensors around the museum that work out where you're spending time in the museum. And all you do with the egg, when you come into the museum, you pick one up and you put it on. You wear it. You put it on a lanyard around your neck and you just have a normal visit in the museum. When you get to the end of your visit, you take the egg off and you dock the egg in its docking station. And, and the egg works out the things it thinks you are most interested in by the dwell time. So which objects did you spend most time in front of? And it comes back and it will print you a small postcard about, with some information about those objects. But then it will pull some information back from our stored collection about things you won't have seen, but we think you would be interested in, and you won't have seen them because they're not on display. And we really like this because... You didn't actually need to do anything. All you need to do was wear this. It just sensed where you were in the museum. It presented you with something you knew, and it presented you with some new content. Um, it looked really lovely. They did a really, really nice job building this. And they'd obviously done some work before they came to the hack day. Um, but we think there's some real potential in, in projects like this. Um, and it particularly because it doesn't change the way you visit a museum. So it's not like walking around a museum with your mobile phone, collecting things on your mobile phone or writing things down. You just put this on and walk around the museum and it presents you with something interesting at the end of that visit. So we had a, a kind of a great time um, doing all of this. And as I say, we ran the event over two days, so a Tuesday and a Wednesday, culminating on the Wednesday when we have a late event at the museum. So we close the museum at 6 and then we open up again at 7 for three and a half hours for an adult in the audience. So we have lots of events in the museum. And we basically re rig the space to put all of these things that have been developed over the two days on display to the visitors that evening. So it's a real opportunity for the teams to show off their work to a broader public, for the public to see something really different and look at different ways of engaging with their collection. Um, as part of the work, we encouraged all of the teams to publish everything they've done. So they all published the code on GitHub. Um, with open licenses so anybody can go back and, and use this. We can go back and, and do some work with this as well. Um, and we also got people to post a blog post on the Digital Labs um, blog. 
So if you want to find out more about what happened as part of that, there are a series of blog posts on the Digital Lab blog, and there are links off to the, um, to the bits of software and the repositories for those software. Um, we, we, we ran this about three weeks ago, um, and we're just doing the kind of final wrap-up and getting final documentation and doing the final summary posts of, of the things that we really liked, what worked well, and partly about how we ran the process um, in preparation for doing another one. And we're looking at doing another one of these days, probably later in the year, possibly in Manchester at one of our sister museums rather than doing it in London. Um, not necessarily about the collections API, we're looking at other challenges in the museum, but it's just a nice way to bring creative people in and do things the museum wouldn't normally do and give people permission to do that. So I think that's me, done. So any questions, I guess? <coughs> yes, you have a, a choice of three people this week to, to ask questions to. So should we start with any questions that we, we have in the room? Um, hi, hello, I'm Xing. I'm from Rock Hajrat. And uh, I'm also very interested in the project of the egg. And I'm wondering if that, uh, if that objects uh, are already being made uh, being manufactured, and so how how does it actually work in the real situation in the sensor museum? So the um, it's it's basically a Bluetooth-based system. So they put Bluetooth beacons by all of the objects, and there's a Bluetooth scanner in in the egg. They built all of the hardware to do that. So it's Arduino and BBC Microbit based, um, and then running running onto a server. So it's not commercially available, but all of the source code is in the repository and there are some instructions on how they went about building that. Great, so any more questions in the room? Martin Keats, um, just an interested member of the public. Um, so if you found statistically analyzing what people were interested in through the egg, might that encourage you to say, well, we'll bring out Certain things yep. from storage, so yeah, right, so they're visible for a bit, even if we have to rotate. Yeah, yep. so it helps to understand what people really. So I think this, you know, this is one of the really interesting things when you open up the data in that way, you yeah. get a better insight into what people are interested in, and that may change the way you display and collect. Yeah. And there were some really interesting things that happened when the Cooper Hewitt in New York. They've got a system. They have a. They give each visitor an electronic pen, and you can go around and you can <coughs> collect things using the pen. And one of the things that they discovered was people, are, people quite like to collect colour. Um, so they were collecting objects by colour, and that made their curatorial staff then do an exhibition that was an exhibition ordered by colour. So not on collection, it was just about tonality of colour. And that was something they'd not thought about doing before, and that purely came on the insight of running that data and, and looking at what visitors did. I think it's worth saying as well on, on the new website. I mean, there's, there's nothing groundbreaking, but actually having the website and monitoring that very closely on what categories, what areas, what objects are searching for. Um, uh, um, using those statistics to look at what's on and how that should affect where areas go is, is something we're looking at feeding back on. Hi, John. How are you doing? Um, so Richard, uh, Richard Leeming, uh, ex of the Res Project, now uh, consultant. Um, I w wanted to talk to you about what you uh, said about licensing your objects under a non-commercial license, and you know, that was a journey with the museum. So, what arguments did you get back from the museum? How confident are you that you can push them to be more open? And have you encountered any problems with licensing under uh, objects under a non-commercial license? Um, <coughs> so, no. Haven't had any problems. Okay. Uh, the reason the non-commercial is used is that uh, licensing images from the collection uh, for people to use commercially, so in books, in TV programs, and so on, is a revenue stream for the uh, museum. And the museum is having, you know, grant and aid from the government is going down, so we're ever looking to find money from other sources. Uh, the, in a way, th and so we want to sort of protect that. Uh, the, in a way, the most difficult thing was we felt it was really important, as well as just to put the license up, uh, was to explain what we interpreted by it. So there are kind of two parts to it, one of which is if we ask for attribution, 
we should sort of say what we want by that, which is fundamentally, I mean, that's a sort of easy one. We say, well, we'd love a link, and we'd like you to use the correct title and date and, and what have you. And the other is to define what we mean by non-commercial. Uh, and because Creative Commons doesn't really do that for you. So, uh, and so uh, clearly making a postcard and selling it would seem commercial. But there are other, if someone puts it on their blog, but they've got Google AdWords on there, is that commercial? Is a, pub is a public lecture that's free, feels non-commercial, but what if you charge money to pay the rent? Is that commercial? So I think we did put in some, we had a lot of conversations about defining the edges of that. Not that I think we'll ever end up litigating or going to court about this, but we felt like it was important to say we think these are the boundaries there. Uh, on the data, which isn't answered your question, but, but it feels important, on, on, on the opening up the data, one of the reasons why we went for the most permissive license we could was we felt like it would be, although it would be nice if people attributed our data when they used it, we wanted to not demand an attribution. And the reason was if you take our data and 50 other people's data, if, if you're a computer programmer, you have to take that little bit of data wherever I use it has to be attributed to this all the way through some piece of complicated software. It's just overly onerous and it doesn't really benefit us and it probably limits the kinds of people that will use it and the kinds of things that they'll do with it. I mean, is it fair to say we, we'd hope people to be responsible? I mean, there is the question that if you put out any attribution and the data changes, and it may because we may find something out new, then it's already gone out there. So, but then I guess we'd, we'd hope that people are using it are using it responsibly. Um, without, as John said, without forcing, with putting that too much weight on that, it's, that's... And in, and in fact, it will change, because the museum data set is not a fixed. Fi a fixed thing. New scholarship and research changes dates, even changes titles, might even change, you know, lots of things. If you start to dig in, they're like unknown thing by unknown maker of unknown date. And over time, we'll work out what those things are. Hannah, do we have any questions online? So um, Charlotte Connolly, who appears to be curator at the Polar Museum, um, and I think she's a PhD student uh, for the Science Museum as well, um, asks, uh, is there anything that might be an easy win for small museums with fewer resources? I th for me, I would say one thing actually now, it's an approach we've taken, is that if you're is doing the, if you've got websites now, actually look at can you turn those HTML pages into almost an API response and have it as a, a JSON and a HTML page because then you've as an in requirement that you almost want two versions of that page, which is quite easy to implement now in a lot of new CMSs. That's not everything, but if you have got those object pages already online, um, and markup as well in those pages as well. I mean. Um, so not necessarily building whole set for complete APIs, but can you extend your website to provide that data in a more accessible way? Um, I don't know if you've got something going. Um, write, writing an API is quite complicated. Maintaining it is even harder. <laughs> 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 I think this is a very valid point. As, as the more you have something that's got to be, someone writes and disappears, then it dies, doesn't it? So it's kind of keeping it in sync. <laughs> so I think probably there's, you can get to the three stars by actually just doing some kind of dump into a CSV file uh, and putting it on GitHub where you're going to get version control sort of for free. Uh, and that's what a lot of institutions are doing. I suppose, it, it, but even with that, to, to dump the data and then to sort of abandon it feels like you'd be almost better off not doing it at all. You do need to maintain it. If you put data up there and people come back and say, uh, they've noticed things that are wrong with it. You need somebody who sort of owns owns that relationship with those people who are using the data. I mean, this, this might go against the grain to some people, but I mean, past few ideas have greatly proposed saying, can you convert all your data into this one particular format? And if all your museums do it, and, but um, different formats, sort of spend all this time, convert it into one format, um, and then we'll all aggregate all that data. Um, and that's fine, you do it once, but then, then you move on and kind of, the, the, in a way, having something like JSON, kind of keeping it something that's really, really web, na um, web native. Um, if your resources are limited, I would say go for just putting something like JSON out there or some marketing your page over, trying to convert it into one specific format. Because in a year's time, everyone will decide that a new, there's a new core format out and that's the, you should all conform to that one. That's not, that's not to dismiss all the efforts to people to try and 
get it into those specifications and those particular formats for particular needs and aggregation. But if your resources are really limited, doing it in one particular very niche format is probably not the best use of your resources. That's not to say you shouldn't be doing that if you have the resources, but if it's limited, doing one very, especially if someone to use that data has then got to read a great big, great big specification document to use it, I think you'd be better off putting it in something there people can just load that data in and get ready and start. And this came from the, the hack day that people were using our API within an hour. They weren't sitting there reading great big specification documents or writing libraries or having to install libraries. They were just using it because we had written in JSON. So. Oh, you were also there in the room and they could ask you. <laughs> they could ask me. <laughs> but was it was sort of self-describing <laughs> as well that kind of we didn't build... And we may go there, and, we, and part of this is to look at how people are using our data. We didn't really want to build this API in a specific format just to put it out there. It was, how do people want to use our data? Come back and talk to us. And if you want to, in a specific format, so we can aggregate it, and we want to do a linked over data, we're totally up for doing that, but we kind of want to see where the usage before. We don't want to just build formats in every single possible format for the sake of doing it. It's, how are you using our data? What do you want? come back and we'll put it in. You, you can actually put a pull request in for the, the code base as well if you really wanted to put your own one in there. Um, but yeah, we kind of, we didn't really want to have 100 formats to maintain. It's sort of which ones are you using, how are you using, who is really using it, I think is. I also suspect that, suspect that over time, and this will probably help small museums and uh, institutions, that, uh, that the underlying uh, collection management systems will start to support things like uh, uh, linked open data and, and publishing out to other formats. At the moment, they're, I mean, they're all pr very proprietary systems. There are a few open source ones, but they're not as sort of, sort of mature as the proprietary <coughs> systems. But there is the, over the last few years at the sort of uh, museum technology conferences, there's a lot more talk about uh, you know, working with the uh, uh, software vendors to start to sort of bake open data into the underlying system. So things like... Um, being able to look, uh, look up um, identifiers outside the system and, and use other things to, yeah. to create linked open data is definitely coming th through that route, which probably makes it much easier than a small museum who, who, who can't hire a team of fantastic developers. Thank you. And we've got another question from Peter Wells, who's our head of uh, research here at the ADI. Um, and he asks, do we have any plans to publish open data about museum use, for example, number of visitors or demographics? I think we publish that anyway through our annual reports. We certainly publish visitor numbers, um, and there'll be a granularity of demographic. And we, we collect the information, and I'm pretty sure it's published in our annual reviews. Thank you. I'm going to be selfish and ask my own question. Um, so you mentioned um, sort of the unknowns within the collection itself, so the things that may have unknown, unknown. Um, uh, uh, exactly. Um, sometimes they're legitimate as well. Sometimes <laughs> it is, it's unknown because it is unknown. It doesn't mean it's, well, you know, it's not a missing entry. So yeah, again. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so, so as well as um, external use of the data, have you considered mechanisms that enable um, external contribution or edits or um, improvement two, of the data itself? Two things there. One is that we actually, and I sort of skipped over it inside. One actually we're talking about using our internal API and a, probably a version of the website that's maybe slightly more enriched internally and getting internal systems to use our own API to build layers and getting the curators to use it as a quick way to look stuff up might have more information but rather than going to these old legacy enterprise systems for really quick lookups getting them to use it as that um, in terms of the second part go on say again sorry so um, yeah interested in sort of collaborative maintenance of the collection and the data that describes the collection and wh whether there's any sort of future in, in enabling others to contribute to that? So sort of crowdsourcing, basically. Yeah, I mean, we, do you want to talk about that one more? Yeah, we're, we're absolutely interested in it, and it's one of, it's in our digital strategy. It's something that we want to, is a sort of logical next stage of the work that you've just seen. Uh, and and in, a, <coughs> in a way, are, are collections much more na naturally lend itself to that kind of approach than perhaps, say, an art history collection? Because there will be communities of interest out in the world who will, who will have a depth of knowledge. Uh, so if you take, for example, we have a, a collection of literally hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of uh, photographs of the railways. And a curator can probably make a guess at where that was and when it was, but probably railway enthusiasts, if we were to put that, you know, 100,000 photographs online and say, tell us where this was and when it was, they'd have probably sort of done it by the end of the day. Uh, 
Um, so, enthusiasts, also people that use those things. A lot of the things in our collection are really things that real people worked with. So, um, in addition to just sort of adding metadata, we're also interested in how people might tell the stories of those objects. So, maybe they drove that bus, or they flew that aeroplane, or they worked on that uh, telephone switchboard. So, there's there's something <coughs> on that side on that side too. So yeah, so we're absolutely interested in that. That's great, thank you. I think Hannah had a question. Thanks very much. I'd love to hear a bit more about how you feel that data is affecting visitor behaviour. So you've opened all this up, and obviously everybody's got more extravagant devices. How is it changing the way that people prepare for a visit to the museum, come to visit the museum, and follow up their relationship? Or haven't you measured yet? <laughs> well, in, in terms of using devices in the museum, um, we've done a couple of pieces of research, so one in 2012 and a follow-up last year, which suggests most people are not using their devices to do things with the collection in the museum and have no great desire to do that. So the things that people use their devices to do are the kind of things you'd expect. It's around social media and around capture of the experience, so taking photographs of things in the museum and themselves with things in the museum. Um, in terms of getting more information about the collection, it's down at about 10% of those people that bring smart devices are, are kind of interested in doing that and an even smaller number actually doing it. Um, so uh, just going, before we start on the redesign, we actually did some measurement of how people are looking at collections on the existing bits of collections across the sites. Um, and it very, I mean, I'm talking about it, but it varies quite considerably between, the, so it's, we actually agree with four museums. Um, there is difference between, so the, so the railway museums you have people who think that they think that they are just an enthusiast, but they're actually extremely knowledgeable. In the science museum, you're people who think maybe the opposite way around that they're actually sort of experts, but they're not. Um, it is, it's, just, it's an extremely I mean, you could do a whole talk on it. It's an extremely varied across all the museums of how people different user groups. And we're going to do another one now. The website's launched, so we're still in beta. Once we're out beta, we're going to do another survey on the website and seeing what kinds of people are using. But it's, it varies, I think, from general interest to people doing homework to people just putting a query into Google um, to people visiting to the museum and planning so it, it re it's, it's across the board and it does change quite considerably across the four different museums as well. Joining up the, joining up the question about audiences and their, their behaviours and the crowdsourcing question there we're also interested in how we might categorise things with very technical sort of jargon heavy ways of describing things but the public actually might describe something very differently. So the example that's often given is uh, if you give dentists to, to categorise a collection of stuff, they'll use words like dental, but, if you, but the public will come and they'll put teeth into a search box. And so to try and look at sort of folksonomies of describing things also feels like a really interesting area to do some crowdsourcing. Yeah, we've been modifying the search engine, looking at those terms. So as John said, like things like people type in trains meaning locomotives or dentals and so we've had to be we sort of continually looking at the front end of how we're putting these we don't want to, we don't want to put in the back end as new terms but on the front end it's sort of these are what the general public so in some ways that's more of a presentation layer thing of looking at when people say this they actually mean this but we're some of those we're not putting in the back end system because they're not effectively they're not cataloging they're more about the user interface there's something behind my question was also an interest in the way that um when websites started emerging for museums and galleries, they were sort of seen as an afterthought, you know, they, they were the documentation, but now I suge I'd suggest that they're the thing that people come to first, and perhaps there's even a shift where it might be, you might have thought that most audiences were coming into the site, now I imagine most of your audiences are potentially external to the site. Yeah, I mean, so, uh, do you want, there, I mean, there's a huge amount of traffic, obviously comes off Google, people aren't searching for the museum, they're searching for objects, and we're launching a whole, our new museum, so, so all of the John can talk about, but all of the the main museum pages will link to the collection pages and vice versa. So in some ways, we see the collection object page as sort of a hub to or sort of the, to all the other spoke pages, whether that's external or lots of our internal content. But whether you want to talk about narratives around that, or go. The, yeah, I mean, essentially, we have twice as many visits to our website as we do to our museums which is a great statistic, just to drop into casual conversations with the finance director when it comes to budget round. <laughs> um, 
is what I mean, in a, in a way, we've gone, for, yeah, we, we've sort of gone from being the, the music, we kind of think of the website both as a sort of companion to a visit and also a sort of standalone destination in its own right. One of the interesting things about collections it, it just is that the interface has to sort of serve everybody from a sort of 13-year-old who's just sort of, ooh, planes, let's look at planes, right through to like a, a PhD at the other end and everybody in between, maybe like a kind of jewellery student who's thinking, oh, I've got a steampunk assignment, let's go to the science museum and see if we can find some nice brass to get inspiration from. And so it's, a, it's quite a complicated design task because it's potentially used in the museum, it's potentially any of these other kinds of uses. So if you're building a kid's website, you just sort of build it for kids of a certain age and you test with them. And so in a way, the design tends to be quite, quite sort of flat uh, and, and sort of functional. Uh, so one of the other things we haven't sort of mentioned is one, looking forward, we're kind of interested in new kinds of discovery because at the moment, this, the, the, fundamentally, this discovery mechanism is a search box, which kind of says, you, you know what you're looking for before you start. You've got to come here with a word in your head or a phrase in your head that you're going to put into that search box. So what it doesn't do is say, here's the wealth of stuff, which is the experience that you get when you walk into the museum. The slide we had at the beginning, which is the Making the Modern World gallery, you go through an archway and there's a massive aeroplane hanging from the ceiling and a pile of cars and a V2 rocket and, it, and rocket the locomotive. And it's kind of incredible. And you don't really get that experience. Once you start digging in and start you know, saying, oh, show me all the beautiful 1930s railways posters, you start to get some experiences like that. But one of the things, but now we have this API, we're, we're thinking about other secondary interfaces that we can build on top of it are much more about serendipity uh, and discovering things that you uh, uh, weren't necessarily came to be interested in. And that was one of the things that was really nice to come out of the hack day was starting to see some kinds of interfaces that just threw you stuff you'd never seen. Because rest assured, no one at the museum has seen all the photographs <laughs> on that online collection website, uh, let alone uh, anyone in the public. Great, so I think we, we're about time to, to wrap up. Um, I think the last thing to do is just thank you guys for coming along and letting us know more about what you're up to. Thank you. Yeah, Pleasure. Thank you very much. <laughs>